Hello and welcome back to Linode. In today's video, we're going to check out the diff command. The diff command is very useful when you want to understand what's different between one file and another file. It's a simple command, but it's a very powerful command. So let's go ahead and dive in and check it out. So first and foremost, what exactly is the diff command? Well, in the intro, I mentioned that it's a command that you can use to determine what's different between one file and another. When you use it, special symbols will appear that'll give you a better idea of what changes you'd have to make in order to make the files identical. If you've never used it before, then it might be hard to get a mental picture of the diff command based on the explanation that I just gave you, so let's see it in action. On your end, you'll need some text files to work with. You'll need two text files, so you could use some text files that you might already have, or you could create your own. Just keep in mind that the purpose of the diff command is to show you what's different between files. So if you decide to use two completely different files, then that's not really a good test. One thing you could do is make a copy of a file that you already have and just make a few changes to that file, but keep the rest of it the same. On my end, I've created these two files right here, file one and file two. So how do you use the diff command? Well, it's actually quite easy. You simply type the word diff, and then we give it the name of the first file. So I'll give it file1.txt. And then we give it the name of the second file. In my case, file2.txt. Just like pretty much every other command out there, if the files that you're using are not part of your current working directory, then what you could do is just provide the entire path to the file. Just make sure that the diff command is able to find the files and it should work just fine. So what's different between file1.txt and file2.txt. Well, I have the command typed out right here, so let's run it and see if anything is different between these two files. Well, that's certainly interesting. There's no output at all. So let's go ahead and check the exit code to see if anything went wrong. I've covered the concept of exit codes in a previous video, so I'm not really going to get into that here. But if the command is successful, then the exit code should be zero. And it is. And actually, an exit code of zero when it comes to the diff command means that nothing is different between the two files. In fact, what we could do is add a special option right here that'll make the output a bit more verbose and actually tell us explicitly that the files are the same. And when I use that option, it then tells us that the two files are identical. But what exactly is inside those files anyway? I mean, it would probably be helpful for you to know what's inside the files so you can confirm or deny that what I'm telling you is true. So let's cut out the contents of the first file. And what I did was I just created some random text around Marvel Comics. I don't know why, but I was thinking about Marvel Comics at the time I created the script for this video. But we have the output right here of the first file at least. So let's do the same thing against the second file. And based on the output, I can confirm that the diff command is telling us the truth. These two files are in fact identical. So what I'll do now is actually change one of those two files. That way the diff command will in fact have a change that it should detect. And what I'll do is change this line right here. I really do like Wolverine, but actually Wolverine is not my favorite Marvel Comics character. In actuality, Spider-Man is my favorite character in the Marvel Universe. So now that I've made that change, I'll go ahead and save the file. And then I'll exit out. So now that we do have a change in the second file, let's run the diff command again. And now we're actually seeing output. And it looks like the diff command has indeed noticed that I've changed the file. So yeah, I love comic books. They're a ton of fun. But what do comic books have to do with Linux administration? Well, actually, nothing. Absolutely nothing. It's a fun topic, but it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. I just used it as an example. So what I want to do right now is show you guys an example of using the diff command for a situation that actually is related to managing a Linux server. But the thing is, though, I was going to show you guys an example, but it looks like my SSH connection was dropped. I was using a Linode instance for the example in today's video. That's where those text files actually were. They were in a Linode instance. And now for some reason, I'm back to my local command prompt. 
But that's fine. All I have to do is press the up arrow to recall the previous command, this one right here. This is the command that I've used to get into the server that I'm using for today's example. And I'll just press enter to reconnect. But I can't. Well, that's interesting. It's telling me that the connection is refused. But it was just working. What's up with that? Now, the irony here is that in order to determine what exactly happened, I'll need to connect to the server and do some investigation. But I can't connect to the server. So what can I do? Well, thankfully, Linode's platform has a remote access utility built right in. And right here in my browser, I'm still logged into the dashboard. So what I could do here is just click on the instance name, in this case, FileServe1, and I'll open the Lish console, which will actually give me remote access to the server. So what I'll do is log in via this console right here. And then I'll type in my super secret password. So now that I'm logged into the server, let's have a look around and see what happened. And you might be wondering, what does this actually have to do with the diff command? Well, you're about to find out. Anyway, since I wasn't able to access the server via SSH, what I'm going to do is go into the configuration directory for the SSH daemon, and that's in the Etsy SSH directory, so that's where I'll go. And right here inside that directory, as you can see, I have a number of config files. Now what's interesting is that I not only have the sshd underscore config file, I also have that same name, but with a .bak extension at the end. Well, that's certainly interesting. And that's also very common when a Linux administrator makes a change to a file. They usually back up the file before they make the change. And if they don't do that, then they should be doing that. And thankfully, even though it looks like somebody made a change to the SSH server, and I'm just assuming that based on the presence of the .bak file, at least they had the courtesy to back up the original file first. So what I'm going to do is use the diff command to find out what in particular is different between those two config files. So I'll type diff, and then I'll type the name of the first file, which is sshd underscore config. And what I want to do is compare that against the backup file. So I'll press enter, and we should see what's actually different between those two files. Well, check that out. Apparently, the port has been changed. So basically, anytime you don't specify the port when you connect to an SSH server via the SSH client on your local machine, then it's going to assume that you want to connect via the default of port 22. In this case, we can see that the port has been changed to port 2222. And I was able to find that out by using the diff command. Again, the entire purpose of the diff command is to compare two different files. When it compared the SSH daemon config file against its backup file, it found that the port was changed, or the line that contains the port itself was changed. So what I'll do is edit the SSH daemon config file and set the port back to port 22. So let's go all the way down here, and I'll change it back. I'll save the file. And now that that's done, what I'll do is restart the SSH service to make sure that the change actually takes effect. So with that done, I should be able to connect to the server. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. I'll go back to my terminal. And as you can see, I still have the output from when the connection was refused. Obviously, if SSH isn't listening on port 22, then port 22 will be refused. That makes sense. But let's try it again. Well, I have a password prompt. That's certainly a very good sign. And now I'm back into the server. So now that I'm back in my terminal emulator and I'm able to use SSH to get back into the server, I'm going to reproduce that same output. So that way I can go over the output of the diff command itself and make sure that you guys understand completely what you're seeing when you run the diff command. And off camera, what I've done is I went ahead and changed the port back to port 2222. I didn't restart SSH, so technically it's still listening on port 22, but I wanted to replicate the same scenario, so that's what I've done. So I'll use the diff command yet again, and I'll do the exact same thing again. I'll compare those same files. So here we have the output. And from this output, even if we don't really understand fully what this output represents, 
we already know that something about the port is different. We could tell that one of the files has port 2222 for that line, and the other file just has port 22. And we can also see a hash symbol in front of port 22. That's very common. If something is set at its default, it's still going to be listed in the config file, at least most of the time, but there's going to be a comment character, a hash symbol in this case, that's going to tell the service, in this case SSH, to ignore that line. And by SSH ignoring that line, well, it's just using the default. But how do we know which file has which line? Is port 2222 within the file on the left or the right? Well, the arrow that's in front of it actually gives it away. The arrow beside the port 2222 line, that's actually pointing towards the left. Sure, that's a less than symbol, but in this case, it really doesn't represent less than, it's just pointing to the direction of the file that it represents. So we have sshd underscore config on the left and sshd underscore config dot back on the right. So therefore, we understand from this output that port 2222 is declared in the first file. Now the second line that's shown here is pointing towards the right. That's actually the backup file, and that makes sense. When somebody makes a change, they usually, or at least they should, make a backup file of that change before they make the change. So when somebody, actually me, but we're going to pretend it was someone else, made a change to that file, they made a change to the original file after backing it up. So that's why we have the new information in the primary file, the one that's not a backup. And then we have the original declaration there in the backup file. But there's definitely more to the output than just the arrows. For example, I've been avoiding the 15C15 that we see there at the top, but I definitely want to make sure that I explain that. And I definitely wanted to save that for after the explanation of the arrows, because the arrows are the most important thing here. But the 15C15 part, that's actually important too. The first 15 refers to the file on the left, and the second 15 refers to the file on the right. So first of all, the numbers here are referring to line numbers. The port number is actually configured on line number 15 when it comes to the config file on the server. The line number for this particular config entry might be on a different line for you, and if it is, that's okay. But basically, it's giving us line numbers, and it's telling us that in order to make the files the same, then line 15 would need to be changed. That's what C stands for, change. And C is not the only character that you might see here. For example, the letter A. If you see the letter A, then that would mean that something would need to be added in order to make the line the same between the two files. In our case, the line number that the port declaration is on was not changed between the two files, so we don't need to add anything in order to make the files the same. If we see the letter D instead, that stands for delete. In that case, that would mean that a line was completely removed. Now let's go ahead and see another change that'll help us understand this even better. So what I've done off camera is I've created another scenario. When I run the ls command here, you can see that I have two additional files that were not there before. I have two Apache config files. I just added a .1 and .2 to the end of each file name, and I made some changes in one of these files. Let's see if we could find out exactly what was changed. So again, I'll type diff, and then I'll start off with the first file here, and then I'll type the second file name. So I'll press enter, and we'll see immediately what's different between these two files. And there's quite a few changes here, aren't there? So basically what I've done here is I've copied the default Apache config file, and I've made some completely random changes. Now the changes that I've made in particular might not be something that you'd want to do in production. When I say random changes, I really do mean random. I just randomly change some things. But what I've done in particular is I've made several changes to one of these files. That way you can see what it looks like when you have multiple changes to contend with. One of the lines reads, this file is managed by Ansible. Directly underneath that, we have a greater than symbol, but there's nothing after the greater than symbol. Well, actually, that means that a blank line was added. So two new lines were added, the first one being the verbiage that I've just read, followed by a blank line. And since the arrow for that particular change is pointing toward the right, the second file, 
then that tells us that the new line was added to the second file in particular. The characters at the top of that change, 0a, 1, comma, 2, actually tells us that lines 1 and 2 were changed on the right-hand side. And on the first file, it shows line number 0, because those lines were not actually present in that file. They were added to the second file. So 1, comma, 2 is a range of lines. So basically, that's lines 1 through 2. Continuing along with the list of changes here, we next see that the timeout option was changed. It was changed to 150 in the second file, but the original file had 300 for that setting. The first file had that line on line number 92, but that line is now line number 94 on the right-hand file because we added a few lines to that file. And since we see the letter C here, when it comes to the change code, then that means that this line would need to be changed in order to reconcile the files. Now, of course, we have a few more examples that have letter C telling us that something was changed, but I think given what I've gone over so far, you should now understand what exactly those particular changes represent. Now, the last change is a little bit interesting, though, because for that one, we have a D character showing up, which I've mentioned earlier refers to delete. So for that one, something was deleted. But that actually makes sense because what I've done is I've removed a blank line that didn't need to be there. So what it's telling us is that a blank line was removed. And I'm okay with that. There was three blank lines between sections when there normally was two. So I just removed one of them. But you know what? Perhaps the output might be even easier to understand if we colorize the output. And for that, what we could do is install a special package. I'll just go ahead and see if it's installed. And in my case it is, but if you don't have color diff on your system, you could just install it with your distributions package manager. And what color diff is, is actually a wrapper around the diff command. So it doesn't do any diff checking itself. It just colorizes the output for the diff command. But anyway, what I can do is just change diff right here to color diff, just like that. And when I press enter, you should see the difference right away. As you can see, the output is colorized. And for some people, that might actually help. If that's something that benefits you, then, well, feel free to install color diff. And you could even consider aliasing the diff command to color diff if you'd like. I do have an entire video about creating aliases. So if color diff looks like something that you might want to use, well, definitely check it out. But anyway, it's the exact same set of changes here. The only difference is that we have colorized output now. Now let's see another variation of the diff command. So for me, I'll just change this back to diff. And then what I'll do is add the dash U option right here. And what does the dash U option actually do? Well, when I press enter, you'll notice that, well, there's a lot more information, but it's also easier to read. So as you can see, we have a lot more output here. So I'll scroll up and you can see that, well, it looks quite a bit different actually. So at the top of the output, we're actually seeing the modification time and modification date of the files, which is always good to have when you're dealing with changes anyway. And then we also see some additional lines here. So we can see some lines before the change and after the change. And that gives us a bit of context around where in particular the change is. I mean, sure, we can look at line numbers, but this is a good way to do it too. And it's also easy to understand which lines actually contain our change codes. We actually see the at symbols, two at symbols on either side of those change codes, which actually draws our attention right to that and makes it a lot easier to find. We can see plus symbols when something is added and minus symbols when something is removed, which is really good to have. So the dash U option might actually be something that you might like as well. And if so, consider making that the default when you go to use the diff command. But with the examples that you've seen in this particular video, you should have no problem understanding not only what was changed between two text files, but also where the particular change actually is inside the file. So there you go. In this video, we checked out the diff command. The diff command, while simple, is a powerful command. A command, as you saw earlier in the video, allows you to easily understand what's different between two files. Now, if this video helped you out, then please click the like button and that'll let YouTube know that this video helped you out. And who knows, maybe more Linux content will be showing up all over YouTube if you click that like button. If nothing else, please consider subscribing. There's some additional content coming very soon that you definitely don't want to miss. And I'll see you in the next video.